One question uh, from my side in terms of the causes of the polarization along identity lines that you have just described. Um, you mentioned roots that go back a long way. Some people say they go back even further than the various factors you named, namely to the so-called southern shift that occurred after, as you know, Lyndon Johnson signed the civil rights laws. He said that he was pretty sure he had just given a generation worth of voters to the, uh, uh, to the Republican Party, uh, meaning that Southern Democrats would react against this, which in fact they did do. And then Nixon with his Southern strategy and Ronald Reagan as well built on that. Uh, in some cases with direct innuendo that definitely was racist in tone. And Reagan, for example, launching a campaign in a southern town that had been the site of a lynching 15 years before. So eventually, the Republican Party becomes a party of angry white men, many of them in the South. Is that also not a factor behind what we're talking about? Uh, well, um, is this microphone working? It should be. OK. Well, there's, a, there's obviously been a long-term trend toward the uh, whitening and mailing of the Republican Party. That's true. The fact that it's based on a kind of racial backlash, in part, is also true. But I think what's remarkable this now is that that is no longer, it, it's not a Southern thing anymore. There are um, indications that Trump is uh, gaining a lot of popularity in states of the industrial uh, Rust Belt, you know, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, I assume you're audience here is familiar with what I'm talking about. That's sort of the Ruhrgebiet of the United <laughs> States. And it is the area in which the, um, in, in the, the impact of, of trade has been, um, um, to the extent it's had a negative impact, that's where it's been felt on industrial uh, manufacturing jobs. You know, a lot of those people, just to put a, a, a correction on it, a lot of those people in those states Barack Obama did carry not with a majority of white votes, but with a significant share of white votes. And what's um, kind of interesting now is this strange overlap between Sanders and Trump in that Sanders in the Democratic primary did best in the whitest states. <laughs> and and it, Hillary Clinton's base of support in the party was the large African-American uh, voting populations in, in the southern states. That was her political firewall against Sanders. So I think, in fact, what's so interesting about what's happening now is actually the dynamic you're talking about is still there, but it's gradually being, it's like it's being absorbed into and overtaken by something different and, you know, that has a lot of similarities, but we're off into a new dynamic that um, is much, I think, is much more about this sense of um, um, uh, not so, it, it, yes, there's this resentment against rising minorities and so forth, but also a kind of economic populism mm -hmm. that was not so much a part of what you're talking about before. I but think. that leads us to a very concerning question. Even, even if we don't call it racism, it's, it sounds like color of skin becomes one of the more important um, features of political identity. And if there is a backlash that white folks feel disenfranchised and uh, there's too much affirmative action or whatever, uh, the whites are still the majority and the not whites are the minority. Can this become a, the dividing line and what would that mean for, you, you said that during the Obama years, it, Obama carried a lot, got a lot of white votes, but clearly <coughs> Donald Trump is looking for white votes and not paying much, much attention how much that damages the not white votes. Of course, of course he says, Latinos love me. No. Mm. I will carry the Latino vote. Women love me. Mm. Um, look, it's, it's complicated because in truth, a strategy, a sort of whites only political strategy will fail over the long term. Mm. It might have sort of one last year in it, uh, but it doesn't have of much of a future because the demography of the United States is rapidly changing. I mean, there's a kind of uh, uh, death spiral quality to this, or you know, diminishing returns quality to this kind of political appeal. And um, 
you know, the irony of it is that after 2012, the Republican Party did this famous autopsy uh, report on its own failure to defeat Obama in 2012 and concluded that they had to reach out now to especially Latino voters and the, the sort of rising uh, demographic groups in the society through immigration reform and other measures. And what they failed to appreciate was that there was still a lot of punch left in that white backlash. And it, it completely, that was going to be Jeb Bush's winning strategy, right, in 2016. Literally, that book was his strategy. And Jeb lasted um, only a couple of weeks against Donald Trump. So there's clearly a lot of punch left in it. I'm somewhat more skeptical that it will continue to have energy beyond this year. The important point, though, is that we are in a very bad place, regardless of who's in the majority and who's in the minority in terms of party support. We're in a very bad place when you can tell what somebody's party is just by looking at them. Mm -hmm. exactly. Thank you very much. Let us now ask the uh, two young ladies to rejoin us on the stage. So we'd like to pick up on the implications of the kind of political fragmentation that uh, Charles was just talking about and certainly welcome your thoughts in general on the subject matter, but perhaps in particular with this question. If you look around at friends and family in the US, would you say you definitely know how they would vote and they all are going to be voting for the same person, probably in this case, Hillary Clinton? Echo, go ahead. Um, yes, but only because I know that my family traditionally votes Democrat down the line. And that's because of all the things that you guys have been talking about with the Republican Party and it traditionally being aligned with white people and white angry men, basically. Uh, so I knew who my parents were going to vote from, from the, for the very, very beginning. And they voted for Bernie Sanders initially, uh, oh. which was not... Uh, most, like he was saying, most of the African Americans voted for Hillary Clinton, but my parents were really in alignment with Bernie Sanders, and now they'll definitely vote for Hillary Clinton. What do you think, Deborah? My community doesn't have a party. They have values, and the values are certainly lined up with Republican values, but they do not predictably vote Republican. Um, Firstly, it's important to talk about the votes in New York State. The Hasidic community is an extremely powerful voting block in New York. Um, politicians cannot win without them. Therefore, there is very often a kind of political bargaining that exists between the community and the politicians running for their positions, where the politicians will offer something that the community wants, and the community will in turn offer their block vote. Um, in my community, when, for example, when I was a young girl in my religious school, the rabbi would come to my classroom with a politician. I remember being 11 years old and meeting Elliot Spitzer. Oh. <laughs> the rabbi would come to the classroom, Elliot Spitzer would say hello, and he would say, please go home and tell your parents not to forget to vote. Then there would be postcards in our mailbox explaining to us what the ballots would look like and where we had to check, where the rabbi said to check. There were buses to bring us to the ballot boxes. Every single Hasidic person voted and voted for whoever the rabbi said we voted for. Hillary Clinton has a great relationship with my community. Although she's a woman, although her image was edited out of photos in Hasidic newspapers because images of women are forbidden, she, however, has entered into this bargaining position ever since she became a senator in New York, and um, she is very good for the community. So it's very likely that if the community sees that her being present will be beneficial for their continued freedom and privilege in the state of New York, that they will vote for her. If, however, they think, Trump is better for them in terms of their survival and their ability to receive benefits from the government, they will vote for Trump. They don't have a party. Um, they see it as a, a system to be manipulated and to be taken advantage of um, as to best serve their needs. Which, of course, is a very Trumpian idea. His book is called The Art of the Deal. Yes. Chuck, also, if you may ask you, if you look around your friends, family, 
just people you know. Do you think it's a clear thing who they will vote for? Would it be the same person or would that be much more divided than we heard before? You know, I, I move inside the Washington bubble. Mm -hmm. You know, I epitomize the establishment uh, media. Uh, so, of course, the media is completely objective and is not, uh, it's not a voting block. But, of course, the, in the circles in which I move are all certainly anti-Trump. You know, I, I live in a suburb of Washington, D.C., which I think the, is something like 75% voter registration is Democratic, you know. But, I mean, I think what we're all getting at is that um, this, uh, it's been written about in a, a famous book called, by Bill Bishop, which I strongly recommend to everyone. I hope it's been translated to German. It's called The Big Sort. And he, he documents how demographically Americans have, over time, um, been kind of segmented into reliably Republican or reliably Democratic um, areas geographically. Um, this is actually a big source of the reason why the Republicans have now a long-term grip on the House, right? It's because the rural areas, uh, which have a lot of representation, are overwhelmingly Republican. And I just want to say one last point on that. This is in, in itself a source of political division now because people like me are regarded as out of touch with people, with other people, you know. And um, the um, same phenomenon I think you saw in Brexit where the experts are rejected, you know, is a widespread feeling in the United States now. And I repeat, both in the Trump and in the Sanders camp, Donald Trump has attacked the Washington Post and the establishment media, but Bernie Sanders did too. He labels it the corporate media that we were supposedly bought off by corporations and so on. And there's a great resentment across the country, and this goes back to my little slide about institutions, against the media and the belief that the media doesn't really understand people, the media has its own agenda, and so on. I will ask again about choices in the election, but from a different angle. Do we see a stronger tendency to, to identity politics? Trump, the choice of angry, white, older men, and Clinton, the choice of minorities and women? Eka? Can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat the first part um, of the question? Well, whether we see a stronger tendency to identity politics. So it's now not cut against what uh, social background or what color of skin you are from, but is it white, male, older against women, minorities, and younger? Um, I think, you know, I, I hear everything that everybody's saying, but I think to some degree it kind of always has been stratified like that. Um, and I think definitely Trump and what he represents is an, an extreme alignment with that particular group. And I think um, Hillary Clinton also represents an alignment with the second group that you mentioned. But I'm just not sure, I guess from my personal experience, that it, I can't think of a time when it hasn't been like that. You know what I mean? Like I have always identified the Republican Party with white angry men. <laughs> uh, so I'm just, for me, this doesn't feel new. I, I understand the, the factors that he's saying and you know, the, the ways that it's breaking out are kind of new in terms of it being alignment with grievances. But for me, in terms of identity, particularly when it comes to race, this doesn't feel new to me at all. It just feels like this is where the energy is being channeled. It's just being channened through uh, Donald but, Trump. It, it, can, I, can I just say one? It, it, it's new, depending on how old you are, uh -huh. it could be new. <laughs> because in the, 60, in the early 60s, there was a significant block of liberal Republicans and a significant block of very right-wing Democrats, right? And the racial politics were still the same. In other words, that the, what, what defined whether you were liberal or right-wing or ha, had something to do with how you stood on the civil rights movement. But it wasn't, um, there was sort of a brief period between the end of World War II and, and 1965 when there was a great deal of crossover. I mean, Mitt Romney's father, George Romney, was walked out of the Republican convention in 1964 because of its turn against civil rights. So back as recently as 50 years ago, you couldn't quite predict a politician's position on civil rights based on what party you can. Now it's not just that. You can predict a person's view on almost everything. Things like what kind of car they prefer, what they like to drink, what TV shows they watch. I mean, we have now, party has come, has come to be aligned with so many aspects of personality that it's really, it's really almost like two different countries. 
Echo, maybe one follow-up question also on that. To what degree do you think that the blockade that we saw from the Republicans during Obama's years in office also was rooted in racism. We heard Mitch McConnell say as soon as Obama was in the White House, he would do everything he could to make sure that Obama would be a one-term president. Yeah. Do you think it played a role? Oh, of course, it's America. <laughs> I think, um, you know, for me, and again, this is all coming from personal experience, um, I think there's always an undercurrent of race in everything in America, it, from my personal experience. And um, I think that the vehemence that we saw and the level of disrespect that we saw towards Barack Obama had a lot to do with his race. Um, we don't even see, I think, that kind of disrespect when it comes to Donald Trump, who is crazy. You know, but the level that we saw with with Barack Obama, I think, definitely had undertones of racism. And I'm not. I'm just. I think that that will always be the case until we actually deal with um, those factors and those issues. I would uh, like to ask a question both to Deborah and Chuck. This was, in a certain way, an historic primary season. The first time a citizen or a politician of Jewish origin has won primaries, and not only one, but several. Why now? And should I ask why so late, or has it nothing, nothing to do with um, his background and where he's coming from? I remember when Joe Lieberman was running on the ticket and how in my community they said this was the one time we couldn't vote for a candidate we supported because his running mate was Jewish and that if we had someone Jewish in the government then anti-Semitism would rise. Um, I think for, I've, I've, I've left my community and I've had conversations with, with regular secular American Jews and my feeling has always been that anti-Semitism isn't considered a great danger in America. It's not on our radar in a real way like it might be here. But there is like an under stated or, or, or non-stated idea, an unwritten rule, so to speak, that visibility can become a problem. That the more that your Jewishness, that one's Jewishness is visible, the more it can then become a target um, for, for people who are anti-Semitic. And um, Bernie Sanders is someone, for me personally, whose presentation and personality and politics and lifestyle is so theatrical, so dramatic, that it almost eclipses the fact that he happens to have Jewish yeah. genealogy, I guess you could say. Um, there's nothing really Jewish about him except the fact that we say that he is. Um, that's confusing for me, <laughs> this idea that you can be something without really being it. Um, I, as an American citizen, I have an American passport that makes me an American citizen, don't feel very Jewish, but I'm introduced everywhere as the Jewish American, which is kind of funny because I don't go to synagogue and um, I don't really do anything Jewish, but I am. And um, I think in, in the States, um, we've really reached a point where you don't really have to be something more than a person anymore if you don't want to. I think it's starting to become possible. I think skin color gets in the way of that. I, I remember being in college and, and reading a book by Edward Bonilla Silva about ra called Racism Without Racists, how America can be systemically racist without having individual racists contributing to that, and talking about what it's like to pass. Like, I, as a white-skinned Jewish American, can pass as not Jewish. I can pass as American because of my skin color. Bernie Sanders, in a way, can try to make people forget that he's anything but American because he can pass. This is his good fortune. And I, um, I wanted to go back to this original question about this identity in politics because I'm probably, in a way, the, the person that, that, that Chuck has been talking about. I am this young person, very disenchanted by the America that I discovered. I left my community and I was really excited to be part of the greatest society that I'd always seen from a distance. I was very excited to take part in the political process. I voted for Obama. I was very full of hope and yes, we can and change. And um, Because to me, Obama represented that every person who felt in any way as a minority in this country could have a chance. He, he was a minority that made it to that position and it made me feel that in my own way as a person with no room, no identity in America, I, I also had a chance. But 
since then, I've really changed my mind. To me, to me, the, the Democratic and the Republican Party no longer feel so dissimilar. And that's, I know that's a very drastic statement because they do have different stances on, on social ideas. They have different stances on gay marriage. They have different stances on, on, on civil rights. But when it comes to the economy, when it comes to financial interests, and, and lobbying and um, why decisions are made and, and, and what is influencing and driving the decisions, I feel they are in the end the same. I feel that the core Democrats and the re core Republicans aren't so different from each other. And I'm disappointed in the Democratic Party because I no longer feel that it stands for anything or, or believes in anything. And this is a, was a very, big disenchantment for me and I, I can't see anything in Hillary but, but someone who will protect the greater financial interests in the country and uh, people like me did suffer because of that and will continue to suffer and that's why I'm not there anymore. Chuck? I'm sorry Chuck, well, I know that's okay. hard to I mean, digest. I, I, don't, I don't think Bernie Sanders uh, is um, I don't think the remarkable thing about Bernie Sanders is that he is a Jew. I think the remarkable thing about Bernie Sanders in American politics is that he is a socialist. Yes. And went around saying, I am a socialist. That was a breakthrough. Mm. And, you know, the, it's been, there's, I try to stick to the data as much as I can. There's, there's long standing polling data that shows for many years Americans have been open to the idea of a Jew as president. The one there, by the way, the one, uh, identity uh, against which Americans have uh, the highest resistance uh, as, pre as a possible president may surprise you, which is Mormon. Um, well over 20% of Americans surveyed said they would never vote for a Mormon uh, to be president, even if it were of their own party. And that's been consistent for more than 50 years. And I leave it to you to figure out if that hurt Mitt Romney in, in 2012. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is a fact. But I don't think the Jewishness was a, any kind of an issue for Bernie Sanders. Uh, it, what, what's original about him and what was a, was a breakthrough was that he was a socialist. And he got this far. And that's re a really important, uh, a huge change in American politics. Can we just address the fact, though, that socialism slash communism has been connected to Jewishness for a but that century? Would, but that huh. would seem to work against him, and yet it didn't. In other words, if But he's if, failed. Well, I wouldn't say, listen, compared to the expectations for Bernie Sanders, I would say he's had a huge impact, a huge success. And, you know, yes, he didn't get the Democratic nomination. Of course, he's not even a member of the Democratic Party. So. Um, considering that he spent his entire career outside the Democratic Party, that he was a Democratic Socialist from a tiny little state uh, in, in the far north of the country, and then he almost defeated Hillary Clinton, um, is, is, is a, a huge, I think he was hugely successful. Yeah, I kind of let, agree. let us, um, you're nodding at that, uh, so perhaps you want to incorporate a word on that, uh, but I wanted to ask you about other grassroots movements that maybe could begin to break through some of the kinds of paralysis and fragmentation that we're talking about, namely, among others, Black, Black Lives Matter. There's a lot of discussion about whether it should become more of a political movement and less of a grassroots movement, whatever that means. Uh, one leading figure is now running for mayor of Baltimore, I think it is. Um, he has faced some resistance within the group about whether that's a good idea or not. Do you think Black Lives Matter can change the phenomenon that we've been talking about? Um, you know, I think it's, I think like any grassroots movement uh, throughout history, it takes time for that to rise to the surface and to be integrated into the larger political system. I definitely think that that's happening. They've been able to impact legislation in some areas. They've been able to uh, impact policy in, a di in different places. Um, so I think it's just a matter of time. Um, I know DeRay ran for mayor of Baltimore and he lost and I know his credibility has been questioned in terms of his ties to certain corporations and how much of a Black Lives Matter activist he actually is and if he just used the movement to kind of rise um, and ride that, that wave to political power. So I think definitely in the future you'll see more 
folks from that grassroots movement become political, become political activists and impact the political system, but I think it just takes time. But this is definitely the movement of our generation. Black Lives Matter is completely millennial. I mean, it was born on Twitter, it was you know social media that rose it to those levels, but I think the larger integration takes time. And it will also depend on what's, what happens with the parties, what it looks like in the future, and all these different things that we're talking about. Very good. I think slowly looking to our watches and also feeling the heat in the yeah. room, we should slowly move to questions and answers from the audience. I have still here the, um, the micro who will carry it around. And we have one question. If people from the gallery would like to ask questions, please come down. We can't see you from here and it will be difficult to carry the micro up. But please come down if somebody from upstairs would like to ask a question and then we maybe there in the back I see already the first hands go up and maybe we will just take yeah. two or three in a row and then we come back to the audience and do, do tell us please who you are if you ask a question and also perhaps to whom your question is addressed go ahead in the back please uh, did that gentleman not want to ask a question Hello? yeah go ahead yes. Well, you know, basically, uh, it's just an observation. You know, I, I think the question begs to be asked, how do we get here? You know, what's the premise here? B because from my point of view, America, the United States, is a country that was built on slavery, genocide, and terrible crimes. I'm going to get to the question in a minute because as a Vietnam veteran, four years in the United States military, I'm from Detroit. And quite frankly, uh, uh, you, you know, the rural beat is not in Ohio, Pennsylvania, or Michigan, it's in China, you know. But what is the motivation to be, to be in a in a system that has done so much wrong and continues to do it, what is the motivation to want to be even part of it without making some type of fundamental change? It seems to me that, and, and there, was, there was no discussion here about the actuality of these countries, Germany, United States, France, uh, all of these countries selling arms across the, the planet. It seems to me that people want to enjoy this privilege of being Americans or being Germans at the expense of other people. You know, and I just can't, you know, there seems to be a disconnect here, a serious disconnect. And as far as the uh, press is concerned, you know, the corporate press, press, if you will, if you go back to Randolph Hearst, Okay, can I, can, sorry, can I ask you to... I, I, just, asked, you have I just asked a question. Yep. What is the motivation okay. to continue right. this madness? Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you very much. Let's go to the question here in the middle. The we'll the we'll group a couple of questions and then get some answers. Yep. Thank you. My name is Andreas Schlüter. I'm a sociologist and internet blogger. And I, well, I very much support... Uh, what my colleague before said, but uh, something else slipped totally off the discussion. That is, uh, well, beside the political sphere, the political class is the, well, what we can call the deep state, the real US power elite, the super rich, uh, and their think tanks. And we have uh, actually, we are confronted with the situation where with great hype, the first female president of the U.S. will present it to us and uh, part of the discussion somehow put the, the two others as, well, strangers to the, to the game, to the sides. And we have totally neglected the fact that the former division between the so-called neocons and the so-called so soft power, which is also an Aurelian name, but the neocons are, well, the more brute force, uh, actually, this, this division is gone, and Hillary Clinton has the almost full support of the neocon fraction of the U.S. power elite, and she is 
She is close, she is close to Victoria Nulet, Robert Kagan, the co-founder of the Project for the New American Century, with the infamous paper, Rebuilding America's Defenses, okay. Announcing Thanks. Biowarfare. Thanks very much. Yeah? Let okay, us, thank you. Let us and put that question to oh, the right. panelists. And uh, I would just beg to differ with you that it wasn't mentioned, because in fact, Deborah Feldman said very clearly she sees Hillary Clinton as part and parcel of a capitalist system that she does not think is working for a lot of people. So yeah, maybe I'll you just, want to pick I'll up on that. I'll say something really brief, actually. I really, um, the first question, I really feel that speaks to me, obviously. I think it speaks to, to most um, Western individuals, but I think um, first you have to sort of uh, take the bigger perspective here. America is absolutely a, a country that has a very a terrible history behind it, but um, so do all countries all over the world. Um, we can look back at uh, 10 centuries of violence and horror and brutality. Um, that's not unique to America. Um, what's unique to America is the myth that I think is still related to the victory of the Second World War, which is that we can save the world and that we are exempt from the rules, that we are special. And this is no longer true, but is still nurtured, I think, by a certain base. But I want to say the motivation behind continuing the madness for me, as a person who's still very much engaged in the Western world and American citizens and living in Germany, I'm very proud to be connected to both societies. The motivation for me is that for as long as we are still part of the madness, we can change the madness. As soon as we fully check out and we say, F this, <laughs> we're no longer gonna have an impact and the people who are gonna have an impact are the people who are still um, trying to, in a way, destroy our world or continue down that path. So I think it's really important for us to stay checked in and to stay motivated in the madness. Thank you. Charles Lane, do you have some thoughts on what we heard? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> do you echo? Uh, I have a couple thoughts. I think, you know, what we're really talking about is empire building. And anytime you are building an empire, there's consequences. We basically are building it on the backs of other people all the time, any empire. And, um, you know, I think what it comes down to is the reason for participating in the system is that if we really look at our history, if we really do the work and we really understand all that was lost in the creating of this empire, our society falls apart. This myth is holding the pillars of any kind of order that we have. Now, maybe the society needs to fall apart. Maybe we need to get back to the root of it and rebuild from the ground up. But I think that you know this whole myth idea, what we're talking about is that these lies are what holds up our society. And without them, what do we become? Without them, what is our education system? Without them, what is our government? And all these things that become exposed. Now, I'm willing to go into the chaos because I think that that's what's necessary to create an actual, real, authentic society. But I think a lot of people live in fear and aren't willing to go into that chaos. And until we get past that point, this is what we deal with, is this kind of madness. Thank you. Shall we do another round of yeah. questions despite the heat? Yeah, yeah. yeah. go ahead. Uh, my name is Sagal. I'm from Technical University, Berlin. I have a very basic question on American elections. I have been following the elections in America over the years. It's a very long, drawn-out process. It starts, a, say, perhaps a year ago, and then it consumes a lot of energy. Then it starts from Iowa and then ends up in California. Then there's caucuses, open primaries, closed primaries. Winner takes it all. I don't know if, even if many Americans know what they are electing. So my basic question is, is this the whole system really democratic? If not, if this, does this system really need an electoral reform? If yes, how? Thank you. Thanks very much. Who else has a question? There's one over here. Um, hi, my name is uh, Alex. I'm from Ohio. I'm with the German-American Fulbright Alumni Association here in Berlin. Uh, my question is very similar to this guy's question. Um, does the media hold any kind of responsibility in terms of educating Americans or informing them in order to make a decision on who they will vote for? Is this something that could be improved in the U.S. if, it's, uh, if they are held accountable for these things? Also, um, I know today Britain exit, uh, decided to exit the European Union. Um, I know quite a few British people who voted leave, and now they say they regret their vote because they were unaware of the big cultural consequences that are now happening. 
Um, I fear that in the US, uh, people will vote for Trump as well just because he's the big effervescent yeah. politician. Uh, but then if, they, if he gets elected, uh, what kind of regret is happening here? And how can the media sort of help the American society deal with this regret? Yeah. Thank you. Charles, do you want to take a well, on stab the, at this? On the first one, it reminds me of something a, a columnist wrote a little while ago he, uh, with respect to a controversial piece of legislation. He said, well, that could never pass in either an election year or the year just before an election year, which are the only kinds of years that we have. Um, we're constantly um, in election cycles in the United States, and um, they, they are now, I mean, this is an old issue. This is the permanent campaign. It was the title of a book, I think, that was written back in the early 80s, if not before, and it's just become more and more uh, of a factor. You know, with respect to political reform, a lot of the um, chaos that your question alludes to arguably is the result of past reforms that attempts to um, uh, fix the system that turned out to have unintended consequences that, um, for example, primaries themselves were thought to be a solution to the um, backroom politics by which parties chose their nominees just among a small group of party bosses. And of course, primaries have their advantages. They are more democratic and so on, but as you say, they take more time, they absorb more energy, they cost more money, and so on and so forth. Um, on the question of the media, um, you know, I have to tell you, um, there's a couple things going on there. I, I don't know if anyone reads the, the Washington Post or whatever, but we, one thing we cannot be accused of at the Washington Post is ignoring like the dangers of Donald Trump. I mean, we, we've literally been threatened by him, you know, because of, of our coverage and our editorial line. There is a problem with the kind of un, unmediated access that he has had to cable television. You know, he has been a, a allowed by certain networks to just stand in front of an audience for almost, in some cases, hours on end just spouting his views because it's good for their ratings. That's a problem. There's an even deeper uh, issue related to social media and its effect on democratic politics, which is not unique to the United States, but it's true everywhere, I think, which is that social media is an extremely powerful, wonderful tool for uh, bringing people together across all kinds of distance and time for helping them establish identities or to understand new identities that they were not aware of and so on. At the same time, it destroys uh, the deliberation because it makes information available instantaneously and uh, enables reaction to the information instantaneously and globally. Um, and um, uh, in terms that are often very uh, inflammatory and demagogic, and that seem to call out for response. So if you think that, you, that any uh, sound and stable and well-performing political system requires some space for people to pause and think before they do something, social media has probably had um, a negative impact on that, but it's obviously impossible to, uh, I mean, I guess the Chinese rein it in, but we wouldn't want to do what they do. So any kind of a solution to the issues we're gonna discuss would have to be able to adapt to a world in which there is near total um, information in, in near perfect real time. To add Deborah, something go briefly, um, I think in terms of election reform, uh, it's always, what's always struck me is th the fact that we have this electoral college and that we have delegates and that very often this results in votes not being counted and the way that districts are divided. So I think as a voter in America, it can very often happen that you don't feel like your vote counts. And the problem with this is that the only time anyone has an issue with that is during an election cycle. But when it's not an issue, nobody's trying to change that. And the only time anyone's trying to change that is when a politician feels that they're losing because of the way the system is rigged. And I, I think that's becoming a bigger problem with time. And uh, about the media, I, I think there, um, 
you mentioned that how D Donald Trump is threatening the paper, and I, and I think that is actually a, a legitimate fear that many newspapers have. Newspapers are, in general, struggling. Media in America is not public the way it is here in Germany. It's not um, receiving that kind of support. And many of them are struggling financially and could not um, take the risk of having someone like Trump or anybody in his on his level, drag them through court for 20 years, which in America is something you can do. You can drag someone through court and, and the legal bills can add, add up whether you're a winner or not. You can end up paying those legal bills. And I think, A, we have way less investment in long-term, in-depth, investigative research journalism. For example, one of the reasons I'm briefly discussed in the media is the fact that Donald Trump has notorious mob ties, but these haven't been fully investigated or presented in the media because A, that would cost a lot to research, and B, that would cost a lawsuit. And I think um, this, this to me, in comparison to the way the media is structured here, I think is a result of the fact that media is private and not public. Chuck, you can bounce back here. I don't want to start an argument, but I just don't agree with all, yeah, any, almost a word you said. I mean, <laughs> the the um, uh, the dependency, just to start with, the dependency on public funding is, is obviously a double-edged sword. I mean, if the government in power doesn't like you, they can cut off your public funding. So if you had a stable supply of private funding, that would be a protection against that. Uh, on the issue of lawsuits, I think uh, American law is notoriously pro-media. Um, we don't have a law like you have in Germany where Erdogan can um, call up the justice ministry and say I've been insulted by a, co a comedian and I want to take him to court. That would have been laughed out of, uh, out of court in the United States. So, and the, the, the American media has laboriously combed through Donald Trump's record, not just this year, but going back to the early 80s when he first started as this sort of um, flamboyant playboy billionaire in New York City. There have been literally books written about his corrupt activities in New York City. This is all on the record. I mean, by the way, this is one of the, the frustrating things about Donald Trump is that all of this stuff, Deborah, is widely known. Absolutely. It is, it is amply documented, and his voters who, by the way, I insist are a minority of this country, and, and he enjoys a 70% disapproval rating, which I think is worth adding to the discussion. Um, the voters are nullifying that information because they believe there's another agenda over here which is more important. Well, and, and so, I mean, it's been extremely frustrating as a, as a journalist to watch sort of the bullets bounce off him, right, as, as we fire, but I, I I mean, I, I'm in the belly of the beast. I've been at the Washington Post a long time, and I've been there through this whole campaign. And I do feel I speak from a position of knowledge about this point. And um, I think it would surprise everyone to, to learn that the Washington Post or institutions like it have been um, somehow cowed or, or, or uh, cautious toward toward all these issues regarding Donald Trump. He even complained the other day that we had 20 reporters working on him full time, which happens to be true. So, um, I think, I think, I, I, I think there's one factor that sort of um, reconciles the two sides that you're talking about. Print and, and television are a very different story in the US. Um, there has been lots of reporting on Trump, lots of criticism of Trump in the established mainstream print media, which are not read but by not, the people who vote. But that's not the same vote. as investigative journalism. Well, Commentary, the, the criticism. New York Times has done a lot of investigative reporting on Donald Trump, but the fact is we have a polarized media consumption now in the US where potential Trump voters are simply not reading those papers that are doing the critical reporting. Which I think goes back to private funding. But I, I still think private funding can be just as manipulative as public funding. You say public funding, the government can decide they don't like you and shut you down. Private funding can decide you don't suit their interests and shut you down as well. Um, I think maybe a combination of the two or a, a certain kind of independence um, from outside interests could help, but that's, of course, impossible to organize right now. It's not impossible to organize. My company is owned by an individual, Jeff Bezos, Bezos yeah. who has all the money in the world and has... has uh, He's a private pr interest. Pri prior to that, it was owned by the Graham family. They overthrew the U.S. government in 1974 <laughs> They overthrew Richard Nixon because they had private wealth and they were immune. They fought him all the way to the Supreme Court during Watergate, the Pentagon Papers, and so forth and so on. 
I mean, I don't want to belabor this, but my point is simply that you can, you can, you, you, you can uh, claim that there's some sort of structural defect in any system of media ownership you want. True. But the, 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 the problem is exactly what Melinda says, is that the information we are providing and which is instantaneously and accurately available to everybody through social media is being nullified by people. It's not that they are unaware of the downside. Why of is it Trump. being nullified? Ask them. Distrust. Yeah, there it, is a distrust. And, and it's because, for example, people like Jeff Bezos are, are considered responsible for the oppression of ordinary citizens in America, and he owns that newspaper. How can we trust a newspaper owned by a person who is violating the rights of American citizens. He well, is responsible he, for horrible work conditions. He's also responsible for the fact that everybody can get their books, you know, overnight free shipping. I mean, at the expense, th there's, there's two at the expense to, of there's two sides to of Jeff improper working conditions. He's a private financial interest. He's a, a billionaire. He's extremely successful, and he has the ability to manipulate a newspaper yeah. because he provides funding. Why well, should anyone you know what, trust Deborah, that? Deborah, maybe, honestly, maybe, honestly maybe I, 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 I just want to end it. You're, 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 Je I, I know Jeff Bezos. I work for Jeff Bezos. I'm in the meetings with Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos has not manipulated the Washington Post. Uh, you know, but you why can, should I believe you? Well, because gonna, I know more about it than you, that, you do. He's going to tell you that over a drink after yeah, yes, um, I, we I, now I shut the panel because I think uh, we nobody have more should, Nobody less. should believe anything. <laughs> okay. That's true. I admit that. But I'm just telling you, you know, I have a point of view that's, you know, maybe we're taking into account. But isn't yeah. this funny how okay. it's a representation of exactly what you described, the, different, the disparity between you and me, you being on the inside, me being on the outside, is actually a really great symbol for the bigger problem that yeah, no. you and me can't even see eye to eye. That's right. true, but I, I repeat that what we're arguing about is an empirical question. It's an, there, there, there may be facts. I hated that word in college, empirical. I felt like all the professors used it when they didn't have another word. Well, I, <laughs> I like it. Yeah. It's a factual, it, it, I'll, I'll get rid of empirical, it's a factual question. There, 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 there may be more truth to one point it's, of view than the a, other, but let's you know, It's let's a fascinating exchange between the two of you, but <laughs> maybe you are both right. Media have a problem with credibility, but it's also true. I'm one of those persons who are using and reading with interest the investigative uh, information about Donald Trump in very good American newspapers. and. I, I must say, I have not the best views about the American cable TV system and how they treated Donald Trump. But in this case, I must say, what I could learn from investigative reporting about Donald Trump, whether it's Deutsche Bank credits, whether it's his love life, whether it's his bankruptcies, whatever, you could all thus read in American newspapers over the course of the last four weeks. And whoever wants to use this information can use it. It's a different question why it's not used to the extent you might be hoping for. But, and now I change into German. Ich muss Sie erstmal beglückwünschen. Sie sitzen hier seit... Uh, so, uh, thank you. You've been sitting here under these very cool conditions, very calmly, and one person said that only Germans are capable of doing that Friday night. Oh, it's almost the weekend. You're outside. You could have a beer outside, and still you're coming in here to have uh, to participate in this panel and, take, and discuss the your, the U.S. elections. So. Thank you very much for staying with us. I think that we got really interesting insights. So the motto for the night was "A pluribus unum." unum. So we heard a lot about this, about the different views on the election year and the parties. Thanks to the panelists. Thank you very much for you as the audience. And we would like to invite you first to a concert and uh, to some refreshments. And you can continue your talks and disputes during uh, this time. So um, enjoy. So we are thanking you as the audience because you also stayed with us. Uh, because Although it's very hard, so we would also like to thank the interpreters. And uh, please give them a round of applause because we believe it's even hotter in the booth. So many thanks to all of our guests. Um, and now, what could be cooler than the blues? So we gehen jetzt ins Konzert. Wir hören hoffentlich coole Musik und wir hoffen, dass Sie wieder dabei sind, wenn wir uns in November am um, 
6, 28. Das ist ein Montag und da werden wir schon wissen, wer, der nächste oder wer die nächste US-Präsidentin sein wird und wir hoffen, dass Sie auch dabei sind. Also bis dann, einen schönen Abend, auf Wiedersehen. Thank you very much and have a good night.